The Equitable Life Assurance Society presents This is Your FBI. This is Your FBI, the official broadcast from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. Presented transcribed as a public service by the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States and the Equitable Society's representative in your community. My name is Fred Barton. I represent the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States. In about 16 minutes, you're going to hear me talking to a young father who's interested in starting an equitable education fund for his little boy. You'll hear me explain why this equitable education fund is the most painless way to pay for a college education ever invented. Why it makes college a certainty for the boy or girl whose father starts one of these plans. Does that appeal to you? Then please listen carefully in about 16 minutes. Tonight, the subject of our FBI file, Armed Robbery. It's titled, The Post-Time Stick-Up. The 21st Annual Uniform Crime Report has just been issued by the Federal Bureau of Investigation. This volume covers the crime picture in the United States during the past year. The general trend has been in one direction, up. Every five minutes during the last year, someone in the United States was feloniously assaulted or killed. During each average day, 146 persons were robbed and 468 cars were stolen. With the passing of each day, more than a thousand places were entered by burglars. The danger of those figures lies deeper than the mere numerals. They reflect that more and more people put under financial pressure choose to relieve that pressure through crime. Tonight's FBI file opens at a small racetrack on the outskirts of a Midwestern city. It is 7.15 in the morning as a short, thin man stands at the rail watching horses work out. He flicks the lever of a stopwatch and looks at it as an equally short, thin man approaches. Hey, Chuck. Hi, Eddie. That filly worked real nice. I caught her in 51 and change. If she don't flatten out this afternoon, you'll win a race. Chuck, I got to talk to you. I know you don't like to ride fillies, but these days I don't pick your mounts. I take what I can get. This isn't about the filly. Last night, there was a thing over at Laurie's school for the parents of all the kids. Mr. Johnson was there. What Mr. Johnson? The one who owns Twilight Song. You said he gave me a $50 bonus for winning on Monday. You got it, didn't you? He gave you a $50 win ticket. Twilight Song was $14 on the front end. You collected $350. That makes you still owe me $300. Eddie, do you think I'd give you a short count? Mr. Johnson said he handed you the ticket himself. Oh. I need that $300. I got a special delivery from that school in Chicago. They'll take Laurie, but they want a year's tuition on the line. Now, where is it? Eddie, up. Uh, look, I'll be honest with you. You couldn't get 300 out of me today with a vacuum cleaner. Well, how soon can you have it? Maybe tomorrow. No maybes. Okay. Tomorrow. Hi, Laurie. Well, come on. Oh, Pop. I'm waiting. <laughs> You're so mushy. I know. Sit down, I'll get your breakfast ready. I was hoping you wouldn't come back so quick. Why? So I could be a late scratch at school. Uh, never mind that. Let's have your glass. That's enough milk. You'll have a whole glass. I'll be healthy enough to run in the derby. Laurie, the derby is for three-year-olds. <laughs> <laughs> That's your favorite joke, isn't it? Uh-huh. How do you want your eggs? Oh, I don't want any this morning, Pop. Just this bread and butter and the milk will be enough. All right, but sit down while you have it. We've got plenty of time. Ready for some big news? 
You're getting a trainer's job. No. This is about you. What did I do now? Nothing. I got a letter this morning. That school in Chicago will take you. But, Daddy, I told you when you wrote to them. I want to stay with you. Now, we settled that once. The leaky roof circuit's no place for a 12-year-old girl. But I don't know anybody in Chicago. What'll I do there? You'll be living at the school. You'll have more friends the first week than you ever had around here. And I'll never get to see you. Oh, yes, you will. I'll visit you. Why do I have to go to that snooty place? Because it's no good for you to be changing schools every time I move to another track. It's no good for you to be living in a trailer with me. I just don't want you growing up in these places. You didn't think racetracks were so terrible when you named me Laurel. Besides, that school charges a lot of money. I can go here free and learn just as much. I got the money. That much? Chuck owes me $300. He said he'd give it to me tomorrow. Daddy. What? If you buy a horse with the money, you'd finally be a trainer. And I could be an exercise girl. No. Nope. You said yourself you were tired of sleeping half the time in Turkish baths and not eating till after the last race. Laurie, and all the... the red board is up. The minute I get the money from Chuck, I'm paying your entry fee into that school. Late that night at the local FBI field office, Special Agent Jim Taylor is at his desk when Agent Bob Franklin approaches. Jim, you left that note on my desk? Yeah, that's right, Bob. We were put on a new case. Oh? Yeah, the money room out at the racetrack was held up this morning. Two men bound and gagged the employees and waited for the bank messenger. How much did they get? $5,000 and all in 50s. One of the bandits was caught this afternoon. Well, that's quick. Well, the money room clerks gave the police such good descriptions, they had positive evidence within an hour. Any loot recovered? No, the man who was captured had $1,500 on him, but none of the serial numbers matched the stolen 50s. How about interviewing him? Well, I did, Bob. He wouldn't talk. But we might still catch up to his partner. Mm -hmm. He had a Pullman ticket for tonight's Pittsburgh Express in his pocket. You figure they were meeting on the train? Yeah. If we're right, we'll meet him at the station in an hour. Well, I have some work to finish here. Okay. I'll take it alone, Bob, and see you later. Hey, Chuck. I've been looking for you all over the track. I've been right here, Eddie. Now, don't give me that. I've been past these stables five times. You want your dough? You mean you got it? <laughs> Put out your mitt. Fifty, a hundred, one fifty, a deuce, two fifty, three. Now we're even. Not quite. What do you mean? I heard about the crack you made yesterday outside the jock's room. You said I had no ticker. Eddie, would I rap a guy I'm handling? You were handling. I'm quitting you. In that case, I did make the crack. That was one to ten. And it's true. You had carnival star in contention yesterday, the far turn, and you dug. I couldn't get through. There was a hole. Not big enough. Stop alibying. Since those two spills, you've been riding like you got Longdon's money. Well, hear me good. Jockeys without moxie are a dime a dozen. I'll have plenty of mounts. You couldn't get a horse in a cavalry. You wait and see. And I'll have a new agent before the first bugle. And this time, I'll get a good one. Bob? Bob, I just arrested that other racetrack bandit. Hey, that's real speed. Now, don't cheer. The case is still wide open. You said the holdup was a two-man job. Yeah, it was. The one I arrested this morning started talking when I put the cuffs on him, but he couldn't tell me where the loot was either. Well, that doesn't add up. He says they sold it. To whom? Yeah, this is where it gets involved. He claims he and his partner bought the plans for the job from a man they don't know. Oh, now, wait a minute. All right, it might be Well, the how'd truth. they make contact with somebody they didn't know? Well, they didn't. A stranger called them, convinced them that it wasn't a police trap, and, well, they agreed on terms. And then what? Well, then yesterday's papers came out with a list of serial numbers on every stolen bill. Yeah. And their anonymous friend called back. He offered to take the hot money off their hands for 50%. Mm -hmm. Well, after they okayed the deal, a messenger came by with the payoff, picked up the stolen 50s. Well, could he tell you where the messenger was from? Well, all he remembered was that he wore a light blue uniform with a red insignia on the left sleeve. That sounds pretty distinctive. Yeah. Well, let's get a list of delivery outfits and start checking. Laurie. Hmm? Oh, hi, Daddy. 
What are you doing home? It's Governor's Day. We got off at lunchtime. What about you? The form says you've got a horse in the first. Eh, they switched to a bug boy. And put away that form. I can't. I haven't figured out the last race yet. That makes no difference. And hey, I almost forgot. You're going. Where? To the school in Chicago. Oh. Chuck paid me, so we've got enough. <laughs> do, do I really have to go? Yes. And let's not talk about it anymore. Daddy. Yeah? There's a colt named Thunderbird in the fifth today. I know. You once rode him. Mm-hmm. Last time out, he picked up nine lengths in the stretch. Today, they're going an extra 16th, and he's got an easier field. Can't miss. The sheet's got him at seven to one. Where'd you see a sheet? The watchman at the back gate had one. Oh. Thunderbird's by Falcon, out of Lady Thunder, so he's bred to run all day. He's dropping eight off his last race. He's got the inside post. How much did Chuck pay you? Three hundred. Three hundred. See, it's seven to one. That's... Wait a minute. What are you talking about? If you bet the money on Thunderbird, I can still go to school. You'll have enough to drop a claim in the box. M maybe you'll get another stymie. You could train him yourself. Laurie, have you got any homework? Sure. Well, but... do it, and I'll see you later. But, Daddy, do your homework. You going... And no more compositions about how to beat the tote board. Taylor speaking. This is Miller, 20th Precinct. Yes, Miller. How are you doing on that racetrack robbery? Well, we thought we had a lead on a messenger, but it petered out on us. A couple of the stolen 50s have turned up. Oh, where? The paramutual windows at the track. Today? Yeah, during the first couple of races. Well, do you know whether they were passed in the clubhouse or the grandstand? The grandstand. $50 window on the upper level. Uh-huh. The clerk's been interviewed, but he didn't know who he got them from. Well, there can't be too many players at that window. It's a holiday, and I understand they've got a mob out there. Oh. Well, what race are they up to now? The third's just been run, but the money hasn't been checked yet. So we don't know if any more bills came in. Well, maybe whoever passed the others is still in the place, huh? Unless he's gone broke. Well, thanks for calling. We'll get out there right away. Daddy? Hmm? Hi. I thought you were going to do your homework. I finished. Oh. It's the next race. What's the next race? The one with Thunderbird in it. Mm-hmm. Have you made a bet? Not yet. I stopped by the paddock on the way up. Saw Thunderbird. He looks wonderful. Oh, does he? Mm-hmm. Did you look him up in the form? Yeah, he's got a chance. Look at the board. He's 12. Yeah, I saw that. 300 is 12 to 1. It's 1,006. Look, whatever it is, forget it. Uh, but with that much money, why, you could claim a good horse. Then you wouldn't have to ride anymore. You'd be training your own horse and starting a public stable. Laurie, this 300 is for your tuition. Now, you've talked me into a lot of things, but this time, I'm going to be firm. Yes, Dad. Thunderbird. Honey, I know the horse. But he's filled out since you rode him. Well, he needed a little weight. There he comes. Number one. Mm-hmm. Oh, Daddy, look at him. Yeah, he seems to be in shape. For a colt who can get off on top, the inside's worth a length and a half. You said so yourself. Yeah, he's no front runner. I know, but he can stay with the pace when he has to. <laughs> Give me a phone. Yeah. I'll show you. Oh. Why, Daddy? Huh? You've got the ring around his name. Well, I like the horse a little. But you've got him handicapped five lengths better than the favorite. Oh, have I? See? Mm-hmm. He's got breed, class, best post position, good boy up on him, and look, he's gone up to 14. He's an overlay at that price. Daddy, bet on him. Please, please. For me... Oh, your mother did the same thing to me. Come on. Oh, 
Let's get to the window quick. Daddy, thank you. Thank you, thank you. Wait till after the race. Let's buy the tickets at the $50 window. That's lucky. Hmm. It's lucky we can go there. We can't lose. We've got the best horse. And we'll put the double, triple goofus on it. Remember how that goes? I'll go down to the rail, lean against it with my left elbow. You go to the hot dog stand, drink a root beer first, then get a dog. Yeah, I remember. Uh, number one, six times. Now, honey, you better get down to that rail and root this horse home. I will, Daddy. And don't you forget everything you're supposed to do. Yeah, I remember. See you at the cashier's window. The horses will reach the gate in five minutes. Hold it, please. Huh? Are you the gentleman who just bought six $50 tickets at that window on number one? Yes. You paid for them with $50 bills? That's right. Why? We're special agents of the FBI. Will you please come along with us? We will return in just a moment to tonight's case from the official file of your FBI. Now for a moment, let's listen to a typical interview between Fred Barton, a representative of the Equitable Life Assurance Society, with a successful young married man named Jim Van Dusen. It seems that Jim has a problem on his mind. Well, as I told you, Fred, I'd passed my college entrance exams and was all set to go when my father died of a heart attack. Well, that was the end of college for me. And I'd sure hate to have my boy have the same disappointment that I did. Well, there's one sure way to prevent that, Mr. Van Dusen. An equitable education fund. Uh, what's that? Uh, one of those college education life insurance policies? That's right. An equitable education fund is an endowment life insurance policy that's set to mature about the time your boy's ready to enter college. If you live, you have his college expenses already in advance. If you die before that time, the fund is fully paid up and the Equitable Society holds the money, paying interest on the full amount until your youngster's ready to use it. It's a surefire way to make certain that your boy won't miss out on a college education no matter what happens to you. Well, that sounds good, if it doesn't cost too much. Don't worry about that, Mr. Van Dusen. It's amazing how fairly small payments grow into real money when you keep it up for 12 or 15 years. Actually, starting an Equitable Education Fund is pretty much like buying a house on mortgage and gradually paying off the mortgage over a period of years. It's the painless way to pay for a college education. Now, let's see. My boy ought to be ready for college in just about 15 years. Well, the sooner you begin an equitable education fund for him, the lower the yearly costs will be. Just give me some idea of how much you can afford to put into an equitable education fund. At your age, for a fund of $5,000 to mature in 1966, the yearly cost would be, let's see... If you have children of your own, why not get the cost of an equitable education fund from your equitable representative? These equitable men don't go in for high-pressure methods. They give you the information you need and let you make up your own mind. Get in touch with your equitable representative soon. All right, care of this station to the Equitable Society. That's E-Q-U-I-T-A-B-L-E. The Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States. <laughs> Now back to the FBI file, the post-time stick-up. In tonight's case from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation, you have seen an example of a perfect answer to the question asked by so many people. What can I do about the crime wave? The two bandits who held up the racetrack money room were described so well by the victims that their capture became a mere matter of hours. If you should be a victim of a crime, or if you should be a witness to one, you can best cooperate with the police by remembering every possible detail. Criminals have been apprehended because someone remembered a small facial blemish, the odd shape of the criminal's hands, the color of his clothes. Nothing is unimportant, and any single observation can be the crucial one. So remember everything you can and give your information to your local police immediately. Like your FBI, they are as close to you as your nearest phone. Tonight's FBI file continues immediately after Special Agents Taylor and Franklin have stopped 
jockey Eddie Harper. Where do you want me to go with you? To our office. Why? I'd like to ask you some questions about that money. Well, jockeys can gamble all they want, as long as we don't bet against the horse we're up on. But those bills were part of the loot from the money room. What? Do you have any more on you? No. Where'd you get the ones you just spent? From Chuck Wolf. He used to handle my book. Uh, handle your book? I'm Eddie Harper, the jockey. He was my agent. He was supposed to get me horses to ride. And he gave you that money? Yeah. When? This morning. He had a whole roll of fifties. That's it. You sure of that? I saw him. Can you tell us where we can find Wolf? He lives at the Bedford Motel down the highway. Well, until we've had a chance to check on him, we'll have to hold you. Hold me? Well, my little girl's here. She'll be looking for me after the race. I'll see to it that she's notified. Bob, I'll meet you at the office after I catch up with Wolf. I'm Special Agent of the FBI. Here are my credentials. Oh. I guess you've heard about the money room holdup yesterday? Yeah, yeah. Why are you talking to me about it? Well, we found someone at the track this afternoon spending some of the stolen money. His name is Eddie Harper. Well, what do you know? It just shows you can't figure these days who's a larceny bum. Well, he claims he got the money from you. Me? Yes, he said you had a thick roll of 50s this morning. Oh, so that's how he's trying to get even. Even for what? Well, Eddie's been desperate for dough these last couple months. Any particular reason? He's got a kid he wants to send to some fancy school in Chicago. That costs pretty good, and he's been on the Oregon short line. Oh, I see. Yesterday, he got a letter from the school. They'll take his kid, but he had to pop for a year's tuition. He tried to put the bite on me, but I wasn't holding him. He beefed. We had a fight, and I fired him. Is there anything else you can tell me? No. no that's all I know, but... If I run into a tip on the stick-up, I'll, I'll call you. Daddy! They let you go. Yeah. There was an FBI man here. I told him you didn't steal anything. They found out for themselves, didn't they? No. But they let you go. Mr. Johnson, the one who owns Twilight Song, came down and put up a bond for me. What does that mean? If I run away, he loses his money. Why should you run away? You didn't do anything. We know that, but they don't. Neither does the commission. They don't think you did it, do they? They're not saying. They just suspended my ride and license till the whole thing's cleared up. How long will that take? No telling. I've been a great father. I bet your tuition money on Thunderbird, he gets beat, and now I'll be a jailbird. They can't send you to jail. Well, they will, unless they find out who really did it. Can't we do something? No, honey. That's the FBI's job. Let's just hope they come up with the right answers. Did you take any calls for me? Nope. Where you been? Checking on the activities of one Mr. Wolf. The jockey's agent? Yeah, I got a pretty strong conviction he's guilty, but I lack proof. What do you base your conviction on? Three more of the stolen 50s turned out. Oh, where? In three stores on the highway, approaching the track. Have you checked them? Yeah, yeah. I showed them pictures of Wolf and Eddie Harper that I borrowed from the general sports desk. Yeah. Each proprietor felt that the man who passed the bill looked like Wolf. Well, that should be enough, Jim. Well, none of them felt they could swear to it, though. Did you question Wolf again? Yeah, yeah. Denied ever having been in the stores. Yeah. Well, the messenger lead is cold. There isn't an outfit in the city that uses that kind of a uniform. Well, that's the link we need. How about putting Wolf under surveillance and see if we can catch him passing a bill? That's the only logical move on your target. Sailor speaking. This is Miller, 20th Precinct. Oh, yes, Miller. Security Bank just called in. Another one of those 50s turned up. Did they know where it was passed? Yes. It was part of a deposit from an outfit called the Hollywood Shop. Out on Oak Road. Well, Sergeant, that should be the lead we're looking for. Fine. Thanks for calling. Bob, one of the 50s was passed at a place called the Hollywood Shop out on Oak Road. That's our missing link. I don't get it. I know that place. They rent costumes. Bob, a messenger uniform is a costume. Yeah, of course. Let's get out there and see if they recognize Wolf.
Laurie. Laurie, the FBI just arrested Chuck Wolf. Oh, Daddy, that's wonderful. And they found over $2,000 in stolen money hidden in his room. Oh, I knew it'd be all right. Now you can write again and everything. Mm-hmm. If I get any mounts. Uh, Mr. Johnson must want you to be up on Twilight Song. Why? He came by and left a note for you. It's on the table. Oh, I hope you're right. He said you gave Twilight Song the best ride she ever had. He's glad you found out about Chuck not giving you the ticket. Why, he even Laurie, said that... listen to this. Mr. Johnson wants me to train for him. What? Old Bones got sick and wants to retire. Mr. Johnson wants me to take over. Oh, Daddy. Now I can be your exercise girl. Now you can go to that school. But, Daddy... Now, this time, honey girl, you don't talk me out of it. I'll get an advance from Mr. Johnson and have him send the money to the school. Oh. Look, baby... I'm trying to do what's best for you. You know that. Don't you? Sure, Daddy. Add a girl. Now, look. I'm holding a case five. What do you say you and me go out and bet it on two big stakes? If money, apple pie? With a place bet on ice cream. <laughs> <laughs> Come on. Charles Wolfe and the two stick-up men were all tried and convicted in a federal court on the charge of bank robbery. In tonight's case from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation, you have seen two special agents apprehend the guilty people after they had conspired to commit a crime. In doing that, they were performing an everyday duty. What made this case more important than the usual theft investigation was the other result, the removal of suspicion from an innocent person. That is the highest function any law enforcement agency can perform, for it proves the Bureau is not interested in convictions, but in facts. Your FBI has proved that many times in the past. It is proving it again throughout the country, even as you sit listening to this program. And it will continue to prove it in the future. Now a quick review of the advantages of an equitable education fund. First, it's the painless way to pay for a college education. You spread the cost over many years instead of taking a beating in four. Second, it's sure. From the moment you start, you're certain your children will get the kind of education you want them to have, regardless of what happens to you. So why delay? Ask your equitable representative for full information on an equitable education fund. Or write care of this station to the Equitable Life Assurance Society. Next week, we will dramatize another case from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. Its subject, Army Desertion. Its title, The Adopted Thief. The incidents used in tonight's Equitable Life Assurance Society's broadcast are adapted from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. However, all names used are fictitious, and any similarity thereof to the names of places or persons, living or dead, is accidental. Tonight, the music was composed and conducted by Frederick Steiner. The author was Jerry D. Lewis. Your narrator was William Woodson, and Special Agent Taylor was played by Stacey Harris. Others in the cast were Jim Backus, Harry Carey Jr., Whit Connor, J.C. Flippin, and Anne Whitfield. This is Your FBI is a Jerry Devine production. This is Larry Keating speaking for the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States and the Equitable Society's representative in your community and inviting you to tune in again next week at this same time when the Equitable Life Assurance Society will bring you another thrilling transcribed story from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. The Adopted Thief on This Is Your FBI. Stay tuned for A Life in Your Hand starring Lee Bowman when it comes your way next over most of these same stations. America is sold on ABC... The American Broadcasting Company.